Hello and welcome everyone to Textile Talks. I am Laura Chapman, the Communications Coordinator at the International Quilt Museum. While we all gather, I'd like to share some information about Textile Talks in case you are joining us for the first time. Textile Talks features weekly presentations and panel discussions from the International Quilt Museum, Modern Quilt Guild, Quilt Alliance, San Jose Museum of Quilts and Textiles, Studio Art Quilt Associates, and Surface Design Association. The programs are held online at 2 p.m. Eastern on Wednesdays. Next week, the San Jose Museum of Quilts and Textiles will present Restoring Textile, or Restoring Textiles with Kira Dominguez Holtgren. As an attendee of today's Textile Talk, you'll receive an email with a link to register for that program. Thank you to our sponsors who make it possible for us to provide these Textile Talks for free. Thank you to Moda Fabrics, Orophil, CNT Publishing, eQuilter.com, Handy Quilter, Attached Ink Misty Fuse, Artistic Artifacts, Nine Patch Fabrics, Schiffer Publishing, and The Quilt Show. We respectfully ask you to be courteous as you engage with speakers, moderators, and other participants during this talk. Please use the Q&A for questions, chat box for greeting others, and survey for commentary and ways we can improve in the future. If you prefer not to see notifications from the chat, you can click on the chat button, button below to toggle them on or off. Before I introduce today's speakers, I would like to wish you all an early happy National Quilting Day, which falls on this upcoming Saturday. Traditionally, we at the International Quilt Museum collaborate with some of our local quilt guilds to have a big festival-like event. This year, we've moved our celebrations online, but we would like to invite you to join us. So visit our Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube pages between 10 a.m. and 4 p.m. Central um, all day Saturday, and you can see lectures and activities and other types of events to help us celebrate the, celebrate the day. So um, on to today's program. Today, we are joined by collector and author Jonathan Holstein and International Quilt Museum Curator of Collections, Carolyn Ducey, as they discuss the seminal exhibition, Abstract Design in American Quilts, which celebrates its 50th anniversary this year. Widely credited with helping bring art world attention to quilts, Abstract Design in American Quilts featured graphic pieces, pieced quilts hanging on the walls more commonly used to showcase large, mid 20th century abstract expressionist paintings. The International Quilt Museum is holding a revival of this exhibition beginning on March 26th. In addition, our other galleries will feature three exhibitions showing the impact this exhibition had on artists, quilt makers, and quilt making traditions. Again, if you have any questions during today's program, we encourage you to type them into the Q&A function. We will do our best to answer as many as we can at the end of the presentation. And with all of that said, I would like to turn things over to Carolyn and Jonathan. Thank you all for being here today. Hi, Laura. Thank you so much. Jonathan, welcome to Textile Talks. Everyone, I want to introduce you to Jonathan Holstein, um, author, collector, advisor, mentor, and a dear, dear friend of mine. Um, we have worked together here at the International Quilt Museum we're going on 25 years, Jonathan. Now that's kind of a scary thought, but today we're celebrating a 50th anniversary. Um, I'm Carolyn Ducey. I'm curator of collections here at the museum. And I'm really looking forward to just having a fun conversation with Jonathan about this incredible exhibition. So um, it was held in 1971, the summer of 1971 at the Whitney Museum of Air American Art in New York City. and it had such an incredible impact. And I, Jonathan, you don't even know this yet, but look what came today. The book. Backwards. Our new catalog, everyone, literally just arrived on my desk this morning. Um, this features a great essay by Jonathan, as well as the curators of our various exhibitions. Um, we're taking over the entire museum for this show. And um, Sandra Sider, who you all know from SACWA, is one of our um, curators and authors of the catalog. So if you're interested, I think it will be up on our shop um, site for sale today. So don't miss that opportunity. It, it smells good still. Um, so Jonathan, um, I'm gonna screen share um, a couple slides here. And what I wanna do is just start out by talking about how you and um, your partner, your wife, Gail Vanderhoof, started this whole process of collecting and, and what it was that you saw in quilts that drew you to them. So first of all, let me go and share my screen. 
Hopefully you're seeing that photo of you and Gail now. Who's that hippie? Who is that hippie, Jonathan? <laughs> Tell me about this photo. I love this. So you were two youngsters just going to Pennsylvania, leaving New York City to go out and collect and came across quilts, right? Yeah, we um, we both had actually had a back, you know, I've been a, a, a collector in quotes since I was a little boy. I started with Roman coins when I was around eight or 10 years old. And, you know, as I found in my life, there's a very thin line between collecting and accumulating. And then the next step is hoarding. So uh, I'm not sure which, I, I know I'm not a hoarder, but I might be towards accumulator. But in any case, Gail and I both had a background in art. I loved Americana. She studied art in college. Her father was a um, museum uh, director in Santa Barbara. And we shared that. Uh, and Gail knew how to sew. She had actually made some, worked on some quilts uh, during her hippie days in Aspen where we met. Um, and we started, you know, we were living in New York and most of our friends were artists. Uh, some of the older generation like Barnett Newman, some of the younger like Roy and Dorothy Lichtenstein, etc. But they, uh, and I was a professional photographer of art and artists at that point in the 60s for uh, catalogs and art books, etc. So that was our life was that scene. It was a wonderful scene then. Uh, New York had become the center of world art, uh, abstract expressionists, color field painters, um, hard edge painters, etc. And you think of the roster of great names then. It was, it was an astounding time. Warhol and Rothko, Nolan, Ken Nolan, Helen Frankenthor, Mar Morris Lewis. It's a very long list. So, so we... Yeah, so into this world of abstract expressionists, you bring quilts. Right. We started going to Pennsylvania to see friends of ours this, just as we, just for fun weekends, short drive from New York. And we started going to the wonderful antique shows and outdoor markets that abound in Pennsylvania. And one day we were looking through every place we went, there were stacks of pieced quilts. Uh, people did buy applique quilts to some extent then, but piece quilts just were, you know, unless people wanted inexpensive bed covers, but they were basically of little value to, uh, in the market. So there were just stacks of them wherever we went and we started looking through them because they were interesting graphically. And all of a sudden we were seeing quilts that really reminded us of the kind of paintings we were seeing in New York at that time. And, and looking at them, we realized that they were, you know, much older, a uh, century or more older than what we were seeing in New York. So our first, our first enjoyment was simply visceral as it is with our these wonderful creations. And the second one was of course, intellectual. How could, what is this? What is this phenomenon? How could it have happened? So we began to collect. They were reasonable enough so we could do that. We were traveling around in our Volkswagen bus, sleeping on top of the quilts as we bought them, which was really fun. I can and, kind of see that in this photo that you two were uh, suited to that lifestyle. <laughs> so we were, then we'd take them back to New York, as you see here, and we'd hang them on the wall and photograph them. And we were keeping careful records about where they came from, et cetera. Unfortunately, none or very, very few came with their makers' names because it just wasn't worth the trouble to the dealers who were stacking these things up. Um, so we, but we, we learned how to date them and we, we began to learn pattern names, et cetera. And then when we accumulated enough, we, we became, obsessed, I suppose that's the right word, with bringing this incredible phenomenon, this, this triumph of American women, um, realizing uh, that there was a kind of, uh, the artists didn't know about the quilts and the quilters didn't know about the art. And yet they were making things which had visual parallels. 
So that was the intellectual uh, focus for us, but also wanting to bring this amazing American uh, phenomenon to a larger audience. So we began to look, we knew that if they, if they went to a craft museum, it wouldn't do it. We had to go to an art museum. And so with the help of a dear friend who was a, a curator at the Guggenheim Museum, she got us a, uh, a uh, appointment with uh, Mac Doty, who was curator of the Whitney Museum of American Art, which is devoted to uh, modern art, uh, not traditional figurative art, but to modern art, abstract art. And I knew that Mac was raised in Connecticut, so he, he'd have seen quilts. And he said, bring slides. And I said to Gail, we better bring some quilts also, because I know he's going to look at the slides and say, OK, I know about quilts. Thank you. And that's exactly what happened. So then I said, Mac, would you mind looking at some quilts? And I think we bought eight quilts, six or eight quilts, carefully selected. <laughs> And, and uh, after we held them up, he sent, sent us a proposal. So we did, and we were in Mexico, uh, and we got a telegram saying, could you have a, in, in the late spring, could you have a show ready for July? And I said, I bet we could. So we went back to New York and it proceeded Voila. from there. Oh yeah, there it is. There Fat it is. So the quote on the left, is interesting yeah. because it's made from uh, cigar bands, silk cigar bands. During the period, 1880s, 90s, that this quilt was made, uh, boxes of cigars and cigar bundles came with bands, with silk bands with the name of the cigar under it. And some people, women, collected them. I was just thinking of their poor husbands, you know, being urged to smoke ever more cigars so the women could finish their quilts. Right. And... Um, so that's the, the story of those. Should I say, talk about a few of the well, others? Um, I'm gonna, we're gonna pick out a few that I thought I would just, um, we'd talk about specifically, but tell me, as you're thinking about this, obviously you're blown away by quilts and their, their design aesthetics, but what was your goal for the show? What were you hoping people were going to take away? Well, the obvious thing that's happening here is that quilts, were the, the size and shape of paintings. So putting them on a museum wall was a natural event. And we picked uh, quilts really carefully. We did it, in fact, at Roy and, Roy and Dorothy Lichtenstein's house in the Hamptons. We, on a beautiful day, we spread 100 quilts out on the lawn and I got up in the gale and I got up on the roof and Roy's two boys moved the quilts around. We said, all right, that one over there, that one over there. And eventually we picked the 60 some quilts that were at the Whitney. And what we wanted to do was to bring this, forcefully bring this phenomenon to the attention of a public, not just interested in art, but the, to Americans in general to understand that American women had created this extraordinary body of work, um, largely uh, anonymously. Uh, at least anonymously, and I don't mean that no one knew who that, but these quilts were treasured in their families. I just mean to the world at large, they just, this body of work was not really known. And we felt that it was incredibly important and needed to be known and accepted as part of America's great aesthetic heritage. So that was our goal with this. It was to bring it to public attention. Also, you know, I, I think it's um, really fascinating because people always um, view quilts as something, and and I think one of the reasons that they weren't perceived in a more of a, I don't want to say the art world because that was a fairly male-dominated field at the time, but I do think that we didn't see these as works of art because they were functional in nature. But when you see quilts and you see quilts that survive, and, and we're always aware of that bias of survival, what survives often is the best, you see how women really poured their heart and their, their artistic ability into their quilts. Whether they knew that that was an element of art or they understood that they, and of course there's a range of quilts from good to bad and 
fabulous to okay or very functional using whatever fabrics you had, but people still had a way of putting them together. And that's, I think, what made them so treasured is that these were women's art expressions. Right. So I think there's that, I think what we're seeing, and we're, we, we're gonna talk about this a little bit later, is this constant dichotomy in quilts where they, they were functional, yet they were fabulous artworks. They were women's work, so they weren't perceived as art pieces. They weren't hung in museums. There's all of these things that are at play here. So yeah. go ahead. Yes, because um, the women who made these quilts did not, I shouldn't say that because I didn't know all of them, but for the most part, they did not think of themselves as artists uh, the way people who devoted their lives to making art successfully or not did. They said, you know, uh, here we were in the middle of the New York art scene and there were many, many artists. I was thinking about my archive the other day, how many people I had photographed, just a few of whom became superstars. The rest of them labored diligently all their lives with, you know, very little success. Uh, so here are these women who uh, didn't consider themselves artists per se, but were doing absolutely, were doing what artists were doing. They were picking forms and colors, uh, thinking through uh, sizes, uh, parts, cutting parts, fitting parts together. They were making art without. Absolutely. And this is what we wanted people to understand. Okay, well, Jonathan, like I said, I picked out a few quilts that are just ones that I love, but really are um, in the overall canon of, of traditional quilt making. They're pretty simple and they're patterns that we would be very familiar with. And I would just love for you to tell us what it was about this quilt that made you select it for the Whitney show. So let me just... So you recognize this oh, one. Oh and I just God. want to say um, this is the cover of your wonderful volume, Abstract Design in American Quilts, that you published in 1992 that really gives a great history of this exhibition and the, um, the impact of the show later. So um, another great um, catalog that you might be interested in. So tell me about this quilt. This, this to me was, was what we saw this, we couldn't believe it. It's, it was like a complete masterwork. Uh, the woman, it's made from the simplest of means, one of the, uh, uh, one of the most uh, traditional nine, it's called nine patch block because three rows of three each, often with a red center to, to center it visually. But in this case, the woman was more or less using up wool, wools. And she managed to make, uh, in effect, a, let's just call it a painting briefly. She managed to make um, a painting, a, a visual masterpiece that uh, is hard to explain why it, why it uh, grabbed you. But the funny thing is that this is a quilt that has, uh, has been very often copied, right, Carolyn? All it, it, yeah. People have done variants of this because it has this mysterious, perfect quality. It's, I can't imagine changing anything in it and you don't have to. Yeah. Well, well, if you look, if you break it down, when you see like, for example, in towards the center there, that, that block where she used four red squares, instead of putting the red square in the center, she put it in the outer border of that, that right. particular nine patch block. And then I also think the way the scale has changed at the lower level of the quilt. Now, that could be practicality, that could have been other blocks maybe, but the fact that she combined those two just to me gives this such a feeling of originality and of a unique piece rather than something that even though it is a pattern, it still has that flavor of that maker. Right. It, um... Yeah, but as I said, she was using material. So when she got to the bottom, she had smaller, she probably had smaller pieces left. So she went, oh, well, and she just finished it. But, she, but I, huh? we don't know that, though. Maybe she said this quilt needs a little edge. Maybe it needs a little something different. 
Absolutely. No, no, do we? But I think you're right. I think many times these decisions were practicalities. Right. But she, yeah. but she, this is a person who had an incredibly good sense of design and, and she just did it. It just works. And people all, over, as I said early, a little earlier, people all over the world have copied this quilt because it's, it just, it just sings and it works. It does. All right, here's another that is uh, what I would consider a very ubiquitous pattern. Um, this is a detail of this quilt, so we're not seeing the entire quilt, but there is something about this pattern. We call it tumbling blocks, baby blocks, diamonds, all these different names, and we see it often. What was it about this pattern that, that you were drawn to? Well, this is one of the, uh, you know, of the, of the, hundreds, perhaps thousands of quilt patterns. This is one of the uh, fairly few three-dimensional patterns. And it's achieved by, very simply, by doing a, a dark, a light, and a medium. When you look at each block, each block is composed of a dark, a light, and a medium. And then in the, the uh, it then, they're put together, it's an ingenious block and they're put together and the thing, it becomes three-dimensional. And the fact that uh, women could do this with, in this case, just uh, inexpensive uh, printed cottons was just phenomenal, we couldn't believe it. And we looked hard for other three-dimensional patterns but they're not that many. So this one was really exciting in, in terms of the Whitney show because it, um, presented a, a, a visual paradox, which some painters over the centuries had tried to do, but here it was very successfully done. Uh, the, so it was very successfully done in a cotton quilt. You know, I always think of the fact that these women didn't have a design wall, they were working in their lap typically, and that how did this, or what was this person thinking about where they could create that overall pattern when they were working in, in such small scale and such small quarters? It's, it's such an, uh, an amazing gift and talent. Um, and it's it just beyond, I just love it. Yeah, the other thing is about these patterns is that they were passed on from women to women. Now, later on, they began to be published in newspapers and women's magazines. But when we're talking about the early beginnings of piece quilts, that wasn't the case. Patterns were passed uh, by, from person to person. And, and we do have some nice early correspondence where women were sending each other patterns. So um, in, in a sense, it was, it was like the art world as it developed of uh, painters slash women uh, seeing each other's work and, and getting together and talking about it and, and seeing each other's work at quilting bees, et cetera. So yeah. there are a lot of parallels between the two creative processes. I think so. I think more than maybe some people realize. I think the other thing that we've found is we've had some, we've got some great 19th century sketchbooks where women really did do a literal drawing of what they wanted their quilt to work on. And they did work out these problems just like an artist would um, and, and really did have a very deliberate plan. This pattern, the way your eye goes back and forth and sometimes you see one pattern, sometimes you see a star, you see that block, I think is just one of the most visually beautiful that I'm aware of. Um, this next quilt, um, we just hung, we're getting ready to open the exhibition in the next week or so. And this is one we just recently hung. And this is a, a log cabin quilt, but it's a log cabin in such a unique and beautiful way. So talk to us about this one. Yeah, the log cabin block is fascinating because the same block uh, manipulated in different ways. It, it's, it's half, if you look at a square, it's half light, half dark with a square center. Now, this one is unusual. It has black centers. Very often the centers are red, but this pattern is an amazing pattern because it, with, with not that significant manipulations, it can create wholly different overall surfaces. And that, of course, is the point. 
um, these blocks of what these are small blocks with blocks of any size are then combined to make this large overall painting in effect. And when you look at this, you keep uh, it, it shifts in and out. The lights, the light comes forward, the light uh, areas come forward uh, of, of four blocks together, and then they recede and, and the dark ones come forward. Uh, and that is an intentional effect. You know, that's what I think is so fascinating because when I first, when, when you look at it, especially when you're seeing it in a slide format like this, you almost get the sense of the, the overlay of some kind of another fabric that would create that darker stripe. But when you, when you look closer, it's literally the way that the light and dark combinations are used together that creates that sense of the overlaid design, that, that diagonal design that goes both ways on it. It's just, it's just so stunningly beautiful and it's even better in person, so. They're all better in person. <laughs> you know, and log cabins are probably our most popular design of literally all quilts. And I think, um, you know, as a learner, one of the first things you learn is the log cabin design because it's a very simple way of constructing from that center block out. And like you said, with using um, when you create your block with half light and half dark fabrics, you can then twist and turn them into three or four different configurations. And so it's one of the most dynamic patterns that I think we have in quilting. Great. And this one I think is great too because it's not truly precise. It's it, it's forming it's formulated in a precise way, but the size of the the logs, the individual pieces, there's a little bit of variation in that that also I think gives it a lot of life. Right. It's gorgeous. All right, we're going to look at one more, Jonathan, and then I want to. Um, so this is a classic that was also on the cover of one of your books, but kind of what I want to shift to after we talk about this is kind of the reaction to the to the exhibition and, and what was happening in the 70s that could make this all happen. So talk to me about this quilt. Well, when we found this one, we thought, okay, that's it. This was the cover of the Whitney catalog, which they, they only, they didn't think that there were going to be that many people at the show, but it turned out at that time to be one of their best attended shows. <laughs> the, uh, uh, and they only printed 3,000 copies of the little catalog we did, but this was the cover. Um, you'll see in the lower left a signature, which is actually not the signature of the maker, but a stencil. In Pennsylvania, uh, men stencil had stencils which they used on their, you know, axe handles, carriages, everything, and someone just you know, this is my quilt. But when we found this one, we thought, okay, this is it. Because it so much resembled uh, the kind of paintings that were being produced in New York at the time. Uh, it, it just, and we, we looked for a name for it. Uh, and never, you know, we found a number of different names. Um, Jacob's Coat being one of them, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. And rainbow. Well, that's obvious. But that's what happened with these patterns. They were were done and, and other people would do them and they'd be named or renamed. But this was such a uh, fantastic um, expression of abstract design that we that we thought, OK, this if we needed one quilt that could prove it, it could be this one. And I just treasure this quilt. It was such an amazing find for us. It, it helped helped us think about how to how to consider these quilts and how to talk about them. So Joseph Emily Hopkins says Joseph's coat of many colors, and that's true. That's one of, that's one of its names. Yeah, it's a great piece. Okay, um, I'm going to stop screen sharing now because I just want to talk to you now about. The, the, the reaction to this exhibition. Um, so 
obviously we know that many reviewers, many individuals who saw the show who were much more well-versed in, in maybe the art world were really blown away by this exhibition. Right, I, I don't know if you have, uh, the most important in quotes, important review was one by Hilton Kramer, who was the, you know, Dean of New York art critics. He was a critic for the New York Times. And his laudatory review was extraordinarily helpful in bringing attention to the show. And then the other New York critics kind of joined in and slowly this news began to filter out. Uh, New Yorkers, New Yorkers are, are great because you know when, it, when, when they get on to something, it, it's, it happens, it's quick. It, it goes out through the, through the audience. But slowly this news began to spread to the, to the hinterlands and Gail and I were getting um, phone calls from columnists from Midwestern newspapers saying, what is all this fuss about quilts in New York? Why quilts? Why New York? And um, it was none of them actually, and I, you know, I would talk about, just as I'm talking now about it, but for the most part, it, it was just noted as an event. Uh, as an interesting event that, you know, crazy New Yorkers are doing, look at, look at what they're, they're doing with quilts. We know about quilts. Uh, what's, what's the big deal? Uh, but it, it reverberated through the art world in, in many ways. There were many articles about it, et cetera. And slowly requests for the exhibition began to come in from other art museums, which was what was important to us. And so uh, it went from the Whitney to the Everson in Syracuse, then the Walker Art Center, which is for modern art in Minneapolis, and finally to the to LACMA, the LA County Museum of Art, and on from there to many other places around the world. But that was the point. It, it, it was a self, it kind of self-launched once. Well, why was that though? What was happening that so many people did kind of like grab hold of this and that it became so wildly successful? Well, it, uh, part of it was this, what's the big deal about quilts, you know, and, and why quilts and all of those questions and why we couldn't answer all of them. And certainly learning about quilts is a lifelong experience. I'm, I'm still learning, uh, but, um, I, but quilts resonated in many communities and the fact that they had been accepted or appointed uh, as a kind of unknown great American art accomplishment uh, was one of the reasons that appealed to people. And the fact that, that muse art museums could hang these things, some of them made locally uh, by anonymous women, not anonymous to their families, but anom anonymous in the sense of the art world was very exciting to people. Um, and, you know, it, it was every once in a while, there's an, there's an art world discovery of some unknown pocket someplace of art and it, it creates- Discovery. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's interesting because not everyone really appreciated the show in the, the way that you presented it. We know that the, this was the age of the, the first, maybe not the first feminist, we shouldn't say, but the feminist movement was really taking hold. So they had a very different reaction to the show, didn't they? Yes, I was widely criticized for not having, um, for, for, sim for seemingly excluding doing wall labels at the Whitney that were done just as they would be for paintings with approximate date, uh, materials, sizes, and unfortunately, artists. What we did not have those names. They did not come with the quilts. Uh, people who were buying and selling them did not save them, unfortunately, except in a very few cases. So we were roundly criticized for that uh, and also, in a sense, for, um, I, I can't remember the exact wording from one, it was, it was taking women's precious work 
and putting it into the hands of the male dominated art establishment. It was phrased somewhat like that. So, you know, yet another poaching job by the male art establishment. Yeah. Well, I think it's a really interesting phenomenon because we know that, you know, there were other um, quilt shows that were happening. And I think Sandra Sider's essay um, and her exhibition called New York Nexus, where she talks about this, this culture of, of art in New York and how other quilt shows were being opened and how, just how, how that, that, it seemed like for that decade, for that brief shining moment, all of these art forms were being welcomed into art museums. All of the, the craft forms that we had, or the decorative arts, all these categories that we have kind of separated out that oftentimes our women's work were kind of separated out. So I think that the, the 70s was just a, a great period in, in that time. So was that your experience that you saw that, that larger happening? Yes, because one of the things, of course, that the art world runs on is money. It's that simple. So um, um, quilts, as because of their presence in the Whitney and other museums, became an art commodity, which they never had been, being sold. Here were pieced quilts being sold in uh, galleries in New York. Um, and people who collected modern paintings, um, for instance, in Albers, uh, the Amish quilts, which were a late, dis a late find for us, uh, the, then we collected as many as we possibly could because uh, they're one of, one of the most glorious examples of American uh, indigenous art. Um, they were being hung on the walls of, of, of chic apartments that had paintings by Albers, et cetera, which they resembled, which some of them uh, resembled. So there was that part of it that hadn't existed before where they were taken from the, the piles in Pennsylvania outdoor antique markets and winding up in New York galleries. So the, the financial side of it what, uh, I, uh, is not to be totally ignored. And it still is part of it. And it began because of the acceptance. Right. Well, let me quote you something um, because I think this is such an interesting discussion. There, there were many other phenomenon that were happening in the 1970s. Um, the back to mother nature, do it yourself, all of these things. And I think they all fed into this, this, this kind of um, interest in these arts. But in, in, you mentioned Hilton Kramer and his New York Times review. And he talks about this that um, he says it's time to rethink the relation of high art to what are customarily regarded as the lesser forms of visual expression. This is an issue that any serious historian of American art is going to have to come to terms with in future dealings with the subject. So let's revert now to um, thinking about the fact that 50 years have gone by and Here's Hilton Kramer. Yes, I know. Um, you were such a young thing when you did the show. Um, but so do you feel like that that, that recognition has, has occurred? Do you, where are we now compared to that, that really hopeful little bubble that occurred when all of a sudden quilts were, you know, we know, well, let me, let you just answer that. Where do you think we are now? Well, that's an interesting question. Um, the, the other thing that it helped, that that exhibition helped uh, promote, promote is not the right word, encourage, was the so-called art quilt movement. You know, they've, we've called them studio quilts, art quilts. There's really not, so far, not the, exactly the right name for them, in my opinion. But um, for instance, in Japan, we did, three exhibitions in the in the 70s and it and it triggered a it triggered a huge interest in making quilts and, and Japanese quilts are some of the best in the world now but all over the world I, I did an exhibition in 2013 for European patchwork and I was astounded to see the variety 
of quilts that were being made. In some cases, they were the most elaborate, meticulous, exact copies of masterpiece um, applique quilts, not piece, applique quilts from the Americas of the 18, America of the 1820s and 30s. God knows how many hundreds of hours went into them. And then by contrast, hanging near them would be things that really were called quilts, but have nothing to do with traditional quilt, front, back, you know, padding. Um, hanging, hanging sculptures that, that would be hard, to, but it called, called a quilt. So one of the results has been to trigger an enormous interest in fabric art, which is what I, I think of it as fabric art rather than quilt art, because that's basically what's happening. Yes, some of it is quilts. People are still making traditional quilts, but they're also making quilts which are indistinguishable in a sense from abstract paintings. They're, they were never meant for the bed, they're meant for the wall. And slowly, the issue has been galleries. There are not many galleries around the world offering them. However, the phenomenon of things like the G's Benz quilts and, and the amazing uh, progression of museum exhibitions that, that they have had have kept this kind of interest going. It's not perfect in the, the way we look at them is not perfect, but it's better than ignoring them. So I don't know how you feel about yeah. that. Well, you know, um, in my essay, I refer to the recent G's Ben quilts and even um, a very recent show of Rosie Lee Tompkin quilts at the, the Berkeley Museum that acquired um, our dear friend Eli Leon's collection. But what I thought was really interesting um, as I worked on my essay is that I looked at the reviews from Hilton Kramer, I looked at the reviews and even Hilton Kramer as positive as, as he was talks about a thing called native genius and he uses certain terms that that couch this as if I think he even used the word unconscious art um, and in the um, reviews of the Rosie Lee Tompkins exhibition which were absolutely glowing and absolutely deservedly so, they still were using terms like that, like this idea that this is, person is creating without any prior knowledge and, and awareness even. And, and so maybe, granted, maybe they don't have art training, but this idea that we are still perpetuating this myth of, Oh, look what we, like you said, look what we discovered. These have been around forever. People have appreciated them and those artists great, got great satisfaction from creating them. But yet we're still fighting this battle. And I, I, I think it's just particularly an interesting topic right now in, the, in our entire world. We're all grappling with a lot of new awareness or maybe not new awareness, but a, a growing awareness that we all need to embrace. And so what are your thoughts now about how we, how we move forward? How do we get out of that idea of any kind of craft item really becoming something that is a lesser art or, or having its own category, for example? Yeah, because uh, uh, categorizing art, you know, with so-called fine art, high art at the top, painting and sculpture, has been the traditional way because it is the, it is the uh, art made for and owned by elites. And it has been not for a hundred years, but for hundreds of years. Let's go back to the Renaissance and medieval period where art was made for people who could afford it. So I think one of the things that I think now is that as, as far as I'm concerned, uh, we should just call quilts, traditional American quilts, art. Some of it is visually or aesthetically uh, maybe better than others, it's just, just as is true in, in, in painting and sculpture, but it still is art. It's made by people who sat down and decided to make a composition and they picked colors and forms and sizes and, and did it. So. For me, it's always been a dilemma. I, I never liked the term art quilts or studio quilts. So all over the world, oh, every day women are innovating. 
They're using materials in ways that's never been used before. They're painting them, they're printing them, uh, et cetera. And so basically there's a move, there's a, a worldwide movement of, of, uh, of fabric painting or fabric design, which didn't exist before or existed in a few places and uh, you know, it was not, there was not much attention paid to it. So when you get, you can get, when you see what happens in places like Japan, when they have quilt exhibitions and tens of thousands of people go through them, you realize that it is a, a worldwide uh, phenomenon. It truly is. Well, you know, this is so exciting, Jonathan. I feel like we barely scratched the surface of what we could talk about, but it's already almost 1.45. And I want to give people an opportunity to um, ask questions. So Laura, I don't know if you've been keeping an eye or Lucy, if you've got some questions for us. So Carolyn, actually, if you click on the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen, um, there are quite a few questions. And I thought if you wanted to take a look at them, you could maybe um, you, you'd be a good judge. But, um, what we should get into first, there are, there are a lot of good questions. All right, Julie Silber. Um, do, Jonathan, do you have any sense of whether New York City artists might have seen a quilt in rural Pennsylvania? Did any of the artists collect? No, not to my knowledge. The uh, Rauschenberg uh, did his bed. It's in the Modern Museum, which Basically, it, it, according to the, the folklore, he didn't, he couldn't afford a canvas. So he simply put a sheet and a pillow and uh, a quilt. He said he mounted the quilt. I, I love, he said he mounted the quilt first, but it still said bed. And then he tried painting over it and it still said bed. So he said, okay, and he put the pillow on. But that's the only, one I know of that at that time where there was any, you know, and, and that was not a continuing interest. It was just a kind of moment for him. Yeah. You know, um, Julie made one other comment that I think is something that probably a lot of people are feeling. And I'm just going to just acknowledge that because I think um, it was an interesting point. She said um, she was asking about why you were using the term painting. It gives the impression that the quilts are aesthetically successful and worthy because they emulate or are like paintings. And she says, and I think we know this answer, do you think quilts are their very own medium and worthy on their own without comparison to a different medium? I think that's a real challenging question because I, I think we can all agree quilts are very much worthy of their own medium, but what the terminology it seems to be where we always kind of get stuck. Yeah, the, 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 the comparisons to painting were necessary to make happen what we wanted to make happen. Uh, and now I agree, uh, uh, it's, it's, oh, well, I call them fabric paintings fabric constructions, you can go any way you want with it. We had to do that initially to get people to look at them, take them seriously, uh, and it worked. So, uh, but now it's gone way beyond that. I agree with Julie, it's gone way beyond that. And new terminology and a new way of looking at it, I, I God knows I welcome um, and try to add to when I can. Yeah. So we had a couple of questions that were just a little bit more practical. Um, the asking about the dates of the quilts that we showed, I would say that um, we showed quilts that were in the period from about 1880 to 1900. Maybe the cigar ribbon quilt that Jonathan first talked about might go into the 20th century. And we date those by a combination of things. We look at fabrics, we look at pattern, we look at the examples that we know are dated and we use them as kind of our benchmarks for how we date other things. Um, the fabrics, all of those things combine. Um, when you really delve into quilt history, people did tend to follow trends or fashion. So you really can kind of follow those through, through the history of what we know. However, as I think Jonathan said earlier in our talk that we're all still really learning we, we, the more I know, the more I feel like the less I can absolutely say 
because there's always an exception to the rule. Yes, we have to, quilts, quilts are, uh, the other thing about quilts is that they have an unbelievable amount of history that you can extract from them in terms of the, the, even the family that made them. Uh, so, uh, but we have to be very careful because someone could in, in 1880 or 1890 could be using materials from 1870. And so we know we can date materials, but that doesn't necessarily mean that's the age of the quilt. There are other things, there's the stitching, there's the cut, there's the thread, um, there's the patterns, uh, as Carolyn said, etc. It's a uh, dating any anything like that is an art as much as a science, but it can be done. Yeah, and here at the museum, we tend to use a 20 year range because we, we can't really pinpoint it closer than that with any surety, but. So here's an interesting comment. It says, um, Charles says, I'm really interested in the use of the term abstract. I might have called them geometric design and he'd love to hear your take. So you're seeing them as more abstract. Is that an accurate way of putting it? Well, no, it, it was just a painting term uh, that we used to, so, to make an analogy between the two forms. Uh, geometric abstraction is, is a painting form that, you know, developed after, after uh, well, developed actually earlier in the 20th century and came forward. And yes, uh, uh, geometric is a, is a perfectly good uh, description of what we're seeing. Um, I, just, I was using abstract um, to equate them with abstract art, that's all. But they, but it is a, a geometric. Uh, it's a ge it's a geometric uh, work. It is without question. So you're absolutely right. Definitely. Um, a couple of people have asked if you have any advice for a young quilt making artist in um, a way to get into exhibitions or publications. That's well, a tough I, one. I wish I knew that. I I. That's not a part of it. I, I think I can judge quilts, traditional quilts, but I let other people make judgments about so-called art quilts because they've gone in so many different directions. And we have people out there whose sole love are those quilts and I leave judgments about it up to them. Uh, quilt guilds are very helpful. Uh, in terms of getting published and get, getting into shows and things. Uh, and there are quilt guilds all over the United States. But uh, otherwise, artists have always struggled, you know, to, to get their work made and seen, and it's no different with quilts. No different. Um, on a different kind of tack, can you talk about the field of quilt scholarship in the 1970s and onward. It seems like it was mostly comprised of collectors, dealers, and self-taught scholars. Has that changed now? Oh, well, there are, there are wonderful uh, professional scholars who, who deal with quilts. I mean, you're much more aware of it than I am, but I, I do read all of, uh, everything I can, but there are highly trained uh, uh, scholars uh, who have trained in art and also trained in textile, history, et cetera, are writing about quilts now. It's, it's not an amateur production at this point. I think we did have, a, we had a great basis of collectors and um, individuals who were writing about quilts and kind of led the way to the academic development that we've seen in the last 20 years, particularly even in our own program here at the International Quilt Museum and the University of Nebraska. So I do feel like it's professionalized, but I do think that there's the, the entrepreneurs, the collectors still have a lot to add to that because there is that, that connoisseurship that you develop as you just look and look and look and familiarize yourself. But I think the two really have to kind of go hand in hand now. So another question, do you still collect, Jonathan? And, and what do you plan to do with your collection? We kind of know that answer. Yes, I do. 
on the acquisitions committee of the museum, so I can't collect anything that should go there. But um, I've kept um, a few quilts of each type for my children who are probably not going to want to hang them because they take up a lot of wall space and they'll all go to a museum. Uh, hope, but I'll let them make that decision. And I mean, how many, you know, I kept a, uh, uh, an Amish, a, a good Amish quilt for each of my kids, et cetera. But it's a responsibility, you, you know, moths, light, et cetera. And a lot of people don't want that anymore and are getting rid of all the things their parents collected. And if my children do that, it's okay. Well, and in um, 2003, way back then, it was when we acquired the bulk of your collection here at the International Quilt Museum. So if you wanted to see more of what Jonathan collected and his very unique eye, um, you could go to our website on our search the collection page. You'll actually see the Jonathan Holstein collection. It will feature all of the pieces that we're showing in abstract design because Jonathan kept that group of about 60 quilts primarily together. So we have 58 of them, but you can also see the other 250 or so that um, you collected and of which many are really spectacular Amish quilts. Yeah, the Amish, we saw our first Amish quilt having no idea what it was covering the springs on a bed on a little antique shop run by a teacher during the summer in Pennsylvania. And we carried it around with us and showed it to people. And people, I don't know, finally someone said, that's one of those dark old Amish quilts and no one wants them. Guess what? <laughs> they were so we concentrated on finding all we could. I don't know how many there are there, 120 or something, 125. But that was, in a sense, the one we're proudest of because once those were gone from the Amish community, there weren't any more really coming out of trunks and there are not many more. So that was something that I'm very, uh, I'm very glad that we did that because that is an amazing body of work. Well, we're, we're thrilled to, to house it and care for it. And I see Laura's back on the screen and that means our time is winding up. Um, I do wanna just let everybody know, um, our exhibitions, like I said, we have the original exhibit we have three additional exhibits that are kind of the impact of the show or that give us some context to the show. So all of our galleries are devoted to this show. A couple of those have already opened, our New York Nexus and Journey to Japan. Um, both of those are going to be the topic of future textile talks. So you'll be able to learn more about those. Um, the Japanese element is one you touched on, Jonathan, that I think is so interesting. These shows, um, if you wanted to see all four, you would want to come between April and the end of July, and you would be able to see all of the exhibitions here in the museum. But Laura is our website guru, and she is posting all of those online, and you'll be able to see all of the quilts and even some gallery shots of those. So um, I hope you take advantage of this. I think this is just an amazing opportunity. I'm so thrilled that we can present this show again but also really bring it up to 2021. And so I just wanna say, Jonathan, thank you so much. We could have spent the afternoon on this topic and we have so many questions that I'm sorry we couldn't get to today, um, but we'll have more programming and maybe we can um, answer some of those questions in the future. So thank, thank you. you so much, everyone. Yeah, Laura. thank you both. And as, as mentioned, um, actually our next three textile talk cover the um, auxiliary exhibits. So each one will to hear from the, the curator who, who um, brought that to you. And so it's gonna be great to see. And as Carolyn mentioned, you can view them on our website. Um, thank you so much for this wonderful program. And again, we would like to thank our sponsors, Moda Fabrics, Orophil, CNT Publishing, eQuilter.com, Handy Quilter, Attached Ink Misty Fuse, Artistic Artifacts, Nine Patch Fabrics, Shipper Publishing, and TheQuiltShow.com for making this program free and available to all of you. As a reminder, we hope you will join us next week for at the San Jose Museum of Quilts and Textiles, and we hope you will all join us for the Quilting Day on Saturday. So with that, thank you all for coming, and we'll see you next time. Thanks so much, everyone. Thanks, Jonathan. Thank you.